Okay, uh, so we'll start the afternoon session. Uh, so we're very glad to have uh, uh, Nima uh, with us here from Princeton. And he's gonna tell us about cosmology, uh, back to the future. All right, uh, it's fantastic to be here at the school um, and at the uh, ICTS as uh, always. Uh, so um, when, uh, I think it was, uh, Rajesh emailed me and, uh, and suggested that uh, um, uh, I talk about uh, cosmology at the school. I was, I was really delighted um, uh, because actually it's a, it's a subject that I've, um, I've, I've thought about now and again over the years and it's something I've been uh, meaning to think uh, uh, more about. It was a good excuse to start thinking about uh, to start thinking more about it again as well. Um, and um, in, a, in, a very, in a very real sense, um, very much of uh, the work that, um, uh, that I've been pursuing over the past uh, decade or so, um, especially in the context of trying to understand the new kinds of structures that might underlie scattering amplitudes and gauge theories and gravity, uh, have really been a warm-up to, uh, to thinking about uh, questions about cosmology and the wave function of the universe. Um, and that's uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I will try to explain in these uh, set of lectures. Um, so this is not going to be uh, a canonical introduction to cosmology. There won't be any pictures of the CMB. Uh, I won't review slow roll inflation. Um, uh, how many of you know about slow roll inflation? Something. Okay. Many of you know. Very good. Okay. So th those of you who don't know, you'll learn what you need to know from the uh, lectures. They'll be relatively self-contained, except for this lecture that'll be a little, slightly more uh, impressionistic in, in, in parts. Um, but they'll be pretty self-self-contained. Um, so you can learn all those things uh, 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 in, in many, many places by now, done very, very beautifully. Um, I want to develop cosmology from a very particular point of view, uh, which is the point of view of trying to get rid of time in our description of uh, uh, cosmology. And um, <clears throat> uh, so let me let me just start off making a, a few a few uh, general remarks about uh, about uh, the whole subject. I mean, uh, cosmology is the ultimate historical science. Um, there are many historical sciences. Cosmology is, you know, is the most glorious of all the historical sciences. Uh, its main driving question, um, both theoretically and experimentally, is what happened in the early universe. And I think uh, either stated or unstated, most people's motivations for pursuing this question is that it might help us uh, get closer towards the still, still vague, still not well-defined, uh, but of course, um, extremely fascinating question of what might, what might have been the origin of the universe. So it's a historical science with very grand questions, but it's a historical science, and like every historical science, it has an interesting relationship to the concept of time, okay? Um, uh, because all the interesting stuff happened a long time ago when no one was around. None of us were around back then. Uh, all we see are some, uh, are some patterns uh, today that we infer the existence of a past in order to make sense of. And we're much more familiar with this, you know, even as kids, in the less glorious, still fascinating historical sciences like paleontology, right? A paleontologist says there used to be dinosaurs walking around the earth uh, tens of millions of years ago. Why? Because no one was around back then. We weren't around back then. Um, but because today in the ground, we see these big bones. <laughs> And then there are little bones inside what looks like the stomach of the big bones. I'm making this up, okay? But uh, but uh, it's probably never quite so quite so 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 direct. But but uh, but you sort of infer, yeah, there are these big monsters walking around. They ate little small things, right? Because that makes sense of the pattern you see. A little closer to home, detectives are historical scientists, right? A detective say, says that person A murdered person B yesterday. Why? He wasn't around yesterday. <laughs> Uh, it's because the bullet from the gun owned by person A is found in the body of person B today, okay? And uh, so this pattern in space today is explained by uh, imagining the existence of a past which uh, gave rise to it by some rational rules, okay? So, uh, so 
That's different than the notion of time that uh, we talk about in other things. It's a, it's a distinction between the fact that cosmology is an observational science versus the fact that, for example, particle physics is an experimental one. Right? Because we can get to set up initial conditions and wait in time and watch it evolve into the future. Whereas here, something happened a long time ago, we had nothing to do with it, and we have to infer the existence of a time in order to uh, make sense of it. Now, said more formally, um, what we can get to talk about in uh, cosmology are measurements of spatial correlations in, a, in the very, very late universe. And um, uh, especially from the point of view of sort of uh, holographic observables, when you have quantum gravity to get very fancy for a moment, uh, the only kind of observables that we can talk about when we have quantum mechanics and gravity, uh, force us to go to, to some boundaries of space and time because we have to be able to do observations with infinitely large measuring apparatuses, and we have to be able to do the observations infinitely many times in order to get precise quantum mechanical uh, observations. Okay, and uh, in cosmology, so in in, in anti de space, we all know what that means. In flat space, uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a little little bit more. It's a little bit less familiar, but there are some null boundaries at the boundaries of uh, Minkowski space. In cosmology, um, had we been in the situation where we had an expanding universe and then the universe opened up and eventually became infinitely big, um, and, uh, and it just continued decelerating, became eventually infinitely big, then the only kind of observable we could talk about in such a situation, uh, you could still wait, you would see the universe become uh, you'd see an infinite amount of sky, and you could lie on your back, and you could ask the question, what fraction of stars are red, what fraction of stars are blue? Okay? Um, and uh, so, now, that's an averaged question. So, because the world is quantum mechanical, we, have to, we, we, we can't uh, say anything deterministically. The only thing we can do is do an experiment over and over again uh, to get a totally precise answer. Now, here, we don't get to do the experiment over and over again. There's only one experiment that was done. Um, but the proxy for doing the experiment over and over again is averaging over space. And uh, that uses the fact, uh, and assuming translational invariance, uh, it uses the fact that the same experiment happened over and over and over again in all the different parts of the universe, so that if you average things over everything you see in space, and if what you have access to becomes infinitely large, you get to do an infinite amount of averaging, then those are the precise observables that you're allowed to talk about. Okay? So we go from anti to pseudo space, where we have boundary correlation functions, very rich set of objects, to flat space, where we have much less to talk about, but still a fair amount. We have the scattering matrix, which is the, what we're, of course, used to talking about uh, as, as in practical physics all the time. Um, and when one step further we go to cosmology, or at least, at least these cosmologies that open up into infinitely large universes, and we don't even get, we don't get to control the initial state, but we get to ask these average questions about spatial correlations. So if we ask more, uh, if we ask more practical questions, what our cosmologist friends have been doing for, uh, for 20 years and what they will be doing for another 20 or 30 is measuring uh, density perturbations. Okay, so, so here's an example of something. Um, so uh, you can imagine, uh, and, and hopefully we'll eventually really uh, be able to, to measure these things uh, three-dimensionally, but the first thing you might imagine doing is looking at that. That's the two-point function. And what does that average mean? That average means that literally you measure what delta rho over is here, you measure what it is there, and then, uh, I mean, if you literally measure it here or there, it might be, you know, negative 2, 10 to the minus 5, plus 3, 10 to the minus 5, uh, at literally these two points. But you don't just do that. You take that product, and then you average it over all the places x and y can be with the same fixed separation. Right? So that gives you a function of x minus y, and that's the two-point function. All right? So uh, because of our assumption of translational invariance, we can nicely do this in position space. Uh, we can actually, we, it's, it's really effective to go to momentum space to do this, and if we go to momentum space, in momentum space there'll be a delta uh, k1 plus, plus k2, and now there's something here that, that, uh, that depends on the overall k, and, you know, in the real world, when we say we have density perturbations that are around 10 to the minus 5, 
and that they're approximately scale invariant, then that's what, that's what we're saying. Okay? We're saying that this two-point function uh, in momentum space is around 10 to the minus 10, uh, 1 over k cubed. The 1 over k cubed is there just in order to make up the units. This thing is dimensionless, and when we transform to Fourier space, those are the mass dimensions it has to have. Um, if we say this back in position space, uh, just directly in position space, let's say this is around 10 to the minus 10, and it has a logarithmic dependence on x minus y okay, over some IR cutoff. Okay? But of course, we could talk about all kinds of other things in principle. We, they have not been measured yet, partially because this is, these perturbations are so tiny, these things are all going to be very, very small. But in principle, we could talk about endpoint functions. And once again, we could go to Fourier space. And so there is some function of a bunch of momenta, ki, and there is a momentum conservation. And so for every sort of polygon you can draw on the sky, so I have a bunch of k1, k2, k3, and so on, they all add up to zero. So for every polygon uh, you can draw on k space, there's a number associated with it, right? And those are all the sort of spatial correlations we have in the pattern of density perturbation. So there's an ocean of information in these objects. Okay? So there's lots and lots of uh, information. And a big part of the next 30 years of uh, the experimental program in cosmology, as I said, is to try to see if it's possible to, to measure in much better bound already the three-point function. Which is just a function of a triangle. And a triangle is really fully specified by just giving its three side lengths. So just k1, k2, k3. So, so this is a function of three lengths, k1, k2, and k3. And so that's something that uh, if it's there, we'd like, to, we'd like to see it, we'd like to measure it, and it would have an enormous, enormous amount of information, much, much more information than just this one, essentially one number. There's a little bit more because the dependence is not exactly scale invariant, but uh, there's obviously a huge amount of extra information in measuring the three-point and higher-point functions. Okay, um, so these are... Uh, and uh, precisely because these numbers are small, uh, there is perturbation theory in whatever is going on, the underlying physics, uh, if you imagine it's inflation giving rise to these things, it's very weakly coupled. So perturbation theory is, is going to be great. And that's why uh, all the calculations, of course, people doing these computations explicitly um, are, are all, uh, all carried out uh, uh, perturbatively. So I'm, I'm just mentioning this right now as just a concrete example of the kind of observable that we're talking about. Again, we assume in order for them to be precise quantum gravity observables, we have to assume the universe becomes infinitely large, blah, blah, blah. Our own universe is not like that because of our Desiderate expansion now, or accelerate expansion now. And that's one of the, that's the largest, uh, I think, conceptual challenge probably in all of physics. It's so hard, it's very unlikely. I think anyone's going to make any progress on it. Uh, uh, in any time period I could imagine right now, it's a very hard problem to figure out uh, how to deal with the fact that the accelerating universe gives us a finite amount of stuff we have access to, and that means that it simply makes it impossible to divide the world into an infinite me measuring apparatus and the finite systems that are being looked at that's absolutely necessary for quantum mechanics to make precise uh, predictions, uh, to, 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 have, to have precise observations in quantum mechanics that might be the precise prediction of a quantum mechanical theory. So we don't have access to that. Um, of course, in any practical sense, the universe is infinitely, is very, very large, and so it's perfectly, uh, it's perfectly uh, good enough. Although there are uh, the important instances uh, where we're making measurements involving modes that are almost as big as Hubble, where this issue of cosmic variance comes in. The fact that there's a very small number of modes means the experiment was done a very small number of times, and so we're really in the soup there that uh, there are things that we won't be able to, to, to uh, do uh, better. Um, okay. But, so, I'm, so I'm definitely going to ignore that very deep fact about the absence of... Uh, of uh, proper quantum mechanical observables in our physical universe because of the, uh, all the complications uh, and mysteries associated with the uh, de Sitter space. <clears throat> okay, now, 
what is the object that's supposed to calculate all of these things? Okay, the, the object that's supposed to calculate all of these things is the uh, pompously named wave function of the universe. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, that's because, well, all we're trying to do is, is make predictions for uh, all these spatial correlators. So um, if there is, let's say, a scalar field associated, something gives rise to delta rho over rho, like an inflaton or something like that, um, well, then there's going to be a wave function that just tells you, uh, psi mod squared will tell you what the likelihood is that that field configuration uh, you'll see, and you use that wave function um, to compute expectation values, and uh, those expectation values will be exactly these things that we're talking about. Okay? Now, um, so uh, we could just directly jump to talking about the correlation functions. Or we could talk about the wave function first, and then still leave as a step uh, to go to do the averaging, to do the uh, to compute the expectation values using this uh, wave function. In most, just technically, in most of the uh, inflationary literature, people like to use a formalism where they calculate the the correlation functions directly. If you do that, use a schwinger kelders formalism, et cetera, et cetera, perfectly fine. Um, for the purpose of these lectures, I want to focus more directly on the wave function. Um, it has slightly nicer properties, and uh, I'll be able to talk about um, a few more things uh, if I do that. Okay, but now, but now comes the sort of main, the, the, the main question and the, the sort of attitude of these lectures that I want to, to explain. Um, the question is, what are the rules? What are the rules for, uh, that govern uh, what this uh, object is? What I mean is, uh, if someone comes along we know what the rules are if someone hands me some, some theory, some inflationary theory, I have an action, I can calculate. We're going to review that. We're going to review that and talk about it in some detail uh, so to become comfortable with doing perturbative calculations of the wave function of the universe. Okay, no problem. We're going to do that. Um, like I said this lecture will be slightly more impressionistic, but we'll do that in the remaining lectures. That will be a big, big, big part of it. Um, so then you say, okay, then I, I, I know what the rules are, but I'm not asking that. You see, the, uh, this thing doesn't depend on time. It knows nothing about time. This thing is just a property of the late universe. Okay, So all the measurements we're making are measurements in the late universe. And I'm asking, if someone came along and said, here, here's a wave function of the universe. I did the calculation. Okay, I'm just, um, uh, don't worry, I did it right. Okay, um, You're like, gosh, I don't want to do all that work. Uh, they probably did it right, but what, what do you check to see if they're right or wrong? Okay, what are the invariant properties that the uh, that the wave function is supposed to have uh, in order to be consistent with having arisen from reasonable uh, unitary causal local evolution in the past history of the universe? Okay, we don't know the answer to this question. Actually, I think we're not particularly close to knowing the answer to this question, um, and I think it's a very important question to try to do some uh, to do some work on and try to understand more more sharply. Okay, let me contrast the situation with. Uh, I'll just go go down uh, from here. So one step down from cosmology is a question about the S matrix. Okay, now you can say, do we know all the rules for the S matrix? So I, I do the same thing. All those Feynman diagrams are very complicated. Someone computed them. They hand you the final answer. How do you know if they're right or wrong? Okay, uh, now, here you say, oh, OK, well, the answer should be Lorentz invariant. OK, yeah, fine, it's Lorentz invariant. It should be unitary. That, that seems pretty tough. It needs to satisfy s dagger s equals 1. And so you might think just Lorentz invariant and unitarity are very, very powerful constraints. And, um, and if you satisfy them, more or less, you, you have to have uh, a reasonable theory completely false, okay? It is a triviality to write down a, a totally non-perturbative, exact, uh, exactly unitary S matrices that are Lorentz invariant and complete garbage, okay? And the reason is a simple one. It's not unrelated to what we're talking about here. It, it, because again, um, you know, you're an experimentalist at CERN, you wake up in the morning, you collide your protons, you have your coffee, you spend a long time doing it, I'm not saying they're lazy. Uh, uh, you go back in the afternoon and you look at what came out, right? There's just a bunch of histograms, a lot of stuff came out. So 
Uh, you weren't around, you weren't in the proton when the gluons hit each other, then another gluon hit it, another quark hit it, and so on. Just, you threw some things in, you closed your eyes, you came back, they all came out. And now I'm asking the question, uh, what in that data it carries the imprint that uh, I came from consistent unitary local evolution in the interior of the space-time, okay? Uh, we don't know the answer to that question. We don't know the answer to that question even in perturbation theory today. Okay? And the people in the 1960s, um, this was the heart of the S-matrix program, you see. This is what they, this is, uh, well, we roughly know the answer to this question. We roughly know the answer is that the S-matrix has got to be, the scattering amplitudes that need to be suitably analytic functions of the kinematic variables, okay? They can't have like random, sharp, very terrible singularities. They have to be politic enough, but they're not. They're definitely not, they're, they're definitely not free of singularities. There's branch cuts, there's sort of a complicated singularity structure, but the causality is somehow imprinted in the analytic properties of the S matrix. But you can ask, is there a God-given, can we derive, do we know what those analytic properties are a priori ahead of time? No, we do not. And if you open up, if you have the misfortune of opening up any of those old books on the analytic S-matrix, which I strongly discourage you from doing, um, uh, then you will find uh, exactly this, that they, they have all these great, wonderful words, and then they're like, gosh, what should these analytic properties be? I don't know. Let's look at some Feynman diagrams. Okay, let's look at some Feynman diagrams. Then, and then the rest of the books are about looking at Feynman diagrams and seeing the analytic properties and then pretending that they didn't know and going back and saying, oh, no, we still need to know. We look at some more Feynman diagrams. Uh, so uh, they didn't know. Okay. Uh, we still don't know today, even though we know much, much more about the property of scattering amplitude. We still don't know today. The situation is slightly better. Uh, um, uh, the, slight, the, the situation is a little better in perturbation theory. We know exactly what locality and unitarity mean at tree level. Precisely, the, the, at tree level, the amplitudes are just rational functions of uh, momenta uh, and, and, and maybe helicities or polarization vectors. Uh, they have poles. Their poles have got to be in very particular locations. Only when a sum of the subset of the momenta goes on shell. Um, that's an imprint of locality, and the amplitudes have to factorize on those poles. That's the imprint of unitarity. And so you can check uh, if someone hands you the answer and they say, you know, you know, I did the Feynman diagrams for 10 gluon scattering. You can check if they're lying to you by seeing if the poles are in the right place and whether they factorize properly. We also know the answer at one loop. Um, because at one loop, the structure of the transcendental functions that show up now, now they're not, they don't just have poles, they have branch cuts, but they're well enough understood at, at one loop. They're in four dimensions, they're dilogarithms, in D dimensions, they're, they're uh, uh, like in six dimensions, they're four logarithms, and so on. And we understand their structure well enough to be able to say exactly what kind of discontinuities they need to have in order to be compatible with the, uh, uh, with the causal, uh, uh, evolution description, but beyond one loop, it's a, it's a topic of active, active research to try to figure out what that means. Things are a little better still if we back up from uh, asking for the final amplitude at the level, uh, the, the final functions, but we stop at the level of uh, what you can call the integrand of the amplitude, what you get before you integrate over the in internal loop momenta. And at that level, things are almost perfect. Still not quite, but they're, they're, they're almost fully understood because there we know that unitarity and causality have to do with where... Now we have rational functions again, you see? We're, we're not... Uh, they still just have sort of normal poles. And now we know they have to have poles in the right kind of spot. And again, if you put internal particles on shell now, there should still be a kind of factorization. So the sort of textbook picture of the cutting rules and unitarity and so on is something that makes a lot of sense at the level of the, uh, at, of the uh, integrand. But, um, but I want to stress that even for something much cleaner and much more familiar, people have done decades more work on, um, after all this time, we still don't know the rules even for the S matrix. Now, yeah. Uh, I think that's that's uh, uh, the 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 problem is that you're thinking about the obvious branch cuts, and there's lots of unobvious ones associated with these funny anomalous thresholds and uh, and other things like that. So um, if what you're saying was true, there would be a there would be a well-developed program of just uh, of of using uh, 
this kind of uh, direct unitarity method to calculate things even at one loop. It's not even that easy at one loop, although you can do it, but you could keep going if you've done it. You keep going even numerically. You could do it at two loops. No one has done it at, at, uh, at the two loops. Okay, okay so anyway, uh, let's, let's go one step further to things that, uh, that are... And by the way, notice that in this, in this passage, um, uh, we're, 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 we're going sort of further and further from the real world, right? We started from uh, the sitter, we can't say anything about it all, or accelerating unit, we can't say anything. Ignore that. Cosmology, okay? So our world isn't Minkowski space, it's cosmological. We know almost nothing. Uh, Minkowski space, much closer to the real world. We know a fair bit. Uh, we definitely don't know the answer, even in perturbation theory, not not perturbatively. ADS, we know everything, <laughs> okay? We go to the ADS box, now everything is wonderful. Okay, So when things aren't the real world, things are wonderful. When things are close to the real world, we are confused. I think there's an important clue there. Okay, uh, And the clue has everything to do with, with time and the questions of, uh, of, uh, of, the, night, of the interesting kinds of functions and, and singularities uh, uh, that we get when time evolution matters. Because in ADS, we know the rules perfectly, right? Be it that, uh, we know if someone hands us a bunch of boundary correlators, they have to, they, they, they have to, uh, they have to have the correct short distance behavior, you have to have the operator product expansion, we're done, right? So the rules are perfectly well defined. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, going back to cosmology, I want to make another qualitative comment, and actually Suvrat is one of the people who's, uh, responsible for bringing this to many of our attentions, um, that in fact, so here is a one surprising consistency condition on the wave function of the universe. Yeah, there's a very basic question. Uh, the stuff that gives rise to these spatial correlators is some normal kind of particle physics, elementary particle physics, something, right? Uh, so. For instance, the physics of the, of the scattering of electrons and photons or all kinds of other stuff, ordinary, ordinary physics of uh, even weakly coupled scattering uh, goes into giving rise to the uh, late time wave function of the universe. So, uh, so one consistent condition should somehow be that that, that that wave function is compatible with uh, coming from a unit being associated with something that in flat space would give you a unitary S matrix. Um, but, it, but if you're just thinking sort of naively, you would think, how is that possible? You're asking a completely static question at one late time. How is it possible this would know anything about scattering of elementary particles and so on? But in fact, it's very possible um, because if we just stare at our data here, let me uh, go to imagine we're talking about a four-point cosmological correlation function. So this is the way a cosmologist would draw it with a K1, K2, K3, K4. The way a particle physicists might draw it would be K1, K2, minus K3, minus K4. Okay, it looks exactly like a scattering process. Okay, after all, both the correlator and the scattering uh, involve four spatial momenta that add up to zero because of momentum conservation. Okay, so the amount of data is looks exactly the same. In fact, it's um, these things depend on precisely one extra variable relative to these ones, and that's because here we have something else. Here we have in scattering processes we have the sum of momenta of the particles, but we also have time translational invariance, so we have a sum over energies a delta function of the sum of energies, and then we imagine some particles are incoming, some are outgoing, in order to be able to make that delta function uh, uh, equal to zero. Some energies are set to be positive, some set to be negative. Here, there's no analog of energy conservation, there's no analog of time translational invariance, so all we have is the delta function for the sum of the momenta. So, a cosmological correlations, or the data that goes into the wave function of the universe, depend on exactly the same things as a scattering amplitude except for one extra variable. Okay, they depend on precisely one extra variable, which is the, oh, is the sum of all the energies. Okay, where by energy, there's no actual particle here, I just mean literally like square root of k squared plus m squared, or, or something like that. Okay? So 
So this actually has, despite the fact that it's purely spatial, blah, 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 it has actually more, a little more information in it. And in fact, in a, in a precise sense, and I'll just give you a, 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 an impressionistic example now, uh, in a precise sense, uh, the cosmological wave function actually contains, in some approximation, the scattering amplitude. This is a really remarkable thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's mathematically extremely simple, but I think it's physically very important. And let me just give you a rough feeling for it. So let's say we have a 2 to 2 process with a 5 to the 4 coupling. Then the amplitude that we get for that, the amplitude we get for that is, you know, some coupling lambda, and then there is that delta function for momentum conservation and a delta function for energy conservation. But, and again, we'll review this at greater length in the rest of these lectures, when we do this, when we instead ask for a four-point correlator in uh, cosmology, um, then uh, instead of just things coming in and, and going out to infinity, uh, we're doing calculations over some conformal time eta that ends somewhere, okay? So just to get a, a rough idea of how these calculations could be related to each other, if we go back and think about where all of this came from uh, for the ordinary amplitude, of course, everything is Lorentz invariant, so we treated them on the same footing, but, but this delta function, it's coming, it's coming from the fact that we had time translation invariance, and it arose uh, from an integral over time, which I'll call eta here, e to the i e1 eta, E1 plus E4 eta. And this integral is from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so um, so that's the that's the that's where these delta functions uh, in energy space come from in their origin in position space. Okay, now it's just position space for time. Now again, we'll see it in quite a bit of detail later, but but I think you'll find it pretty reasonable that when we do this calculation, it's something very similar, except the integral is not going to go from minus infinity to infinity, but it'll go from minus infinity to zero. And it's going to get, get cut off. And so instead what I get, what I'll get for the what I'll get for the correlator here is just uh, still the spatial momenta, but I get the integral minus infinity to zero, e to the i, e1. Eta. And so this gives me instead lambda over, ignoring all factors of i and so on, lambda over e1 up to e4. That's sum. Right? So whereas beforehand we had uh, so whereas beforehand we had a delta function of e1 plus e4, now it's replaced by 1 over e1 plus e4. Now, in fact, when we do cosmological calculations, this is literally what we'd get if we were in flat space. And if we we're actually calculating the vacuum wave function with no time dependence here at all, that's exactly what we'd get. You know, more generally, we can get powers here and we can get other things upstairs. But the, the basic fact remains is that where before we had a delta function like singularity, when the sum of the energies goes to zero, now, now there's nothing happening there when all these energies are like their normal, their positive numbers. Uh, because here, they're literally just square root of k squared plus m squared, okay? However, if you, uh, if I just go back to this uh, simple example where it's literally that, if you analytically continue these energies so that some become positive, some become negative, then it's possible to reach this thing as a pole. And the residue on the pole of this cosmological correlator is the S matrix. Okay. In this case, it's pretty trivial because it's lambda in, in both cases. But there's a simple reason for this. The simple reason for it is that, uh, is that where, where is this sum of the energies uh, uh, coming from? It's because the only possible place I could get a, a, a divergence when I'm integrating over times so when I do these calculations, everything is chopped off in, in the future, the only possible place I could get a divergence is when uh, all the times go off into the past. And so what I can do is, is and whatever, whatever complicated thing I might, be, uh, I might have going on, I might have loops, I might have whatever I have, uh, I can take a big circle and surround all of them together. And if I take all of these times, 
to minus infinity together. So there's some sort of center of mass of all those times. A to center of mass. If I take all those center of mass off to minus infinity together, then there is in front of the whole thing, again, just by, uh, by the approximate time translation invariance, in front of the whole thing is there's the one over the sum of all the energies of the external particles, eta, uh, eta center of mass. And then I have lots of other integrals left, left to do, but minimally I have this one. Okay? And this integral could give me a divergence as I go off into the past. It's being chopped off by this oscillation here. Okay? So if you continue so that this sum goes to zero, then you're going to get a singularity, right? You're going to get a, you're going to get a singularity as, uh, as the overall center of mass time goes to minus infinity. But precisely in that limit, you see, precisely when all these things are going off to minus infinity together, the answer doesn't really know about this boundary far, far, far off in the future. And therefore, the result of your calculation is essentially the same as if the boundary wasn't there which is the flat space scattering amplitude. All right. So in this beautiful way, uh, this, the, some singularities of the, uh, the cosmological wave function or the cosmological correlators actually contain in them information about the flat space uh, scattering amplitude. So uh, had we not gone through this argument and known any of these things, I think uh, uh, this, is not, this is not something super obvious ahead of time, but this is one consistency condition. Someone comes up to me, hands me a perfectly healthy looking wave function universe, I check that it's normalizable, everything looks fine. Then I might then go investigate, say, let's see, where, it's, where, where are its singularities? And I would look to see if there is a singularity when the sum of all the energies uh, goes to zero. And then if that thing does not look like a healthy S matrix, and including it needs to be unitary, it needs to have all the properties, uh, all the unknown properties of the S matrix for its consistency, then there's something wrong, right? So that tells us two things. Um, it tells us that uh, that um, uh, these these cosmological questions are a beautiful one-parameter generalization of scattering amplitudes. They really with a single variable, the sum of all the energies. Since we know there's been so much magic found in the structure of scattering amplitudes, B, um, it, it seems very unlikely that that magic is restricted to this convention one surface where the sum of all the energies goes to zero. It's sort of very likely that there's uh, something that extends beyond there and actually controls the structure of the uh, cosmological, um, uh, of the cosmological wave function itself. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, so the first thing that we're going to, so we're going to try to do two things in these lectures. We'll see how we do. Uh, but the first thing that we're going to do is just try in a, a few examples or a few classes of examples to learn how to calculate the wave function of the universe. And we'll begin by, you know, we'll begin by uh, doing things completely, totally standardly uh, with time integrals and the way everyone does them. But then we're going to sort of take a, uh, we're going to approach it from a slightly funny philosophy of, uh, of trying to get rid of any reference to time in the calculations, okay? Because um, what we want to do is, is understand more directly what is the, what's the purely boundary property <laughs> Um, of these objects that determines them. And uh, when we begin with these things where they have a perfectly standard representation in perturbation theory, we have a good start, we can play around and see whether we can think about it in that way. This is going to have, uh, as we'll see, it'll have some concrete applications because uh, in, in even many of the very, very simplest, uh, 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 in some of the very simplest uh, Questions involving, you know, something as elementary as if you imagine you have something like this, you know, a four-point function where you're exchanging a massive particle. Okay, so something where if it was an amplitude, you could do it when you were a child. Um, that object is uh, is not calculated in the literature. Okay, um, and we'll 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 see why. I mean, in in total generality, even. It, uh, you know, if this particle here is a, a, a general mass, it's just a function of four momenta. When we do our inflationary uh, 
When we care about inflation, in fact, there's even a slightly simpler version of this where essentially one of these legs is put to a background, and it's really, it's really a four-particle calculation, but really with one of the momenta going uh, close to zero. So it only depends on three momenta. Okay, so this is something that's relevant for the measurement of uh, the three-point function in non-Gaussianities. Non non if you imagine there are particles with a mass close to Hubble during inflation, and they may have been produced or close to being produced with some small probability during inflation, and you want to know... Uh, you know exactly what you should be looking for. What 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 this this tree level thing? Uh, uh, what is it? You can write down some integral. You can compute it numerically, but there is no nice uh, sort of uh, analytic uh, expression understanding for what it is. What it's understood in various limits, but not in uh, uh, but not in a uh, uh, not in an accessible way analytically. Um, this attitude that we're going to take to try to get rid of time, to do cosmology without time, uh, which in these cases are, are, are turned to very elementary things, nothing very, very deep, but they're going to allow us to do these calculations so we can get analytic answers to these things. And, yes, just because you have general mass in the middle. That's right, something as simple as that, right. And, but in particular, and, and uh, I'll talk about this uh, in a little more detail in, in just a second, there are aspects of these... Uh, of these uh, calculations that really seem to uh, have to do with the physics of time in a crucial way. For example, something we'll just talk about in a moment is that uh, during the inflationary phase, there might be some small uh, uh, probability that due to the time dependence of the background, you actually produce this physical particle M. Okay? You might have physically produced that the particle M, and uh, you can ask, how does that show up in the... How does that show up in the... Uh, Correlators, and we'll give the answer to that it shows up as a particular oscillatory pattern in the three-point function and the four-point function, uh, and that oscillatory pattern in the observable, the spatial observable, is the fingerprint of time evolution in the interior. You really had a time-dependent background. You produced a particle. Its weight function oscillated e to the i m t time time time. Right. So of course. Uh, so when I say that we're going to try to understand everything without time, what we're going to do is we'll begin by writing these things down as normal time integrals, but we'll quickly see that they satisfy differential equations with an interesting property, purely in terms of the boundary variables. Okay? And then we'll start staring at those differential equations, start trying to understand them, and we'll see that those differential equations force on us these oscillatory pieces and all the rest of them without any reference to time, obviously. Okay? So there's a purely boundary understanding of something that we normally ascribe to, to uh, something uh, very time-dependent. So that's uh, something I'd like to uh, get through uh, today. All right, but anyway, so one thing, so there, there, there are two things that I want to do in these uh, lectures. Um, so one thing is to, is to uh, compute, is to play and compute, play with and compute uh, the wave function of the universe, but with this, with the uh, time without time attitude, so much as we can. And, um, but more, more generally, however you do it, um, one, one could hope that if we, if we just get more data and see what these uh, objects look like, that we could start to learn what the rules are. The analog of what we know for, for amplitudes, the analog of the cutting rules, or what we know at tree level in one loop, all of those things, we should, we should learn what the answers uh, to those properties are, just in perturbation theory for the wave function of the universe. Okay, And we can generate more data in that way. And these things could also be potentially useful for experimentalists, at least for providing templates for things for them to look for. Examples of things, things like this. As I said, many limits of these things, I'm, you can also give it to them numerically, many limits are known analytically, but it would be nice to have a, you know, a really good, uh, a solid answer to this, uh, uh, to this question. It could even be useful to experimentalists. But there's a second thing that we could do, again, and these are, these are, uh, uh, all in the analogy with uh, uh, things that have been done in the context of, uh, of, uh, of amplitudes. So you can say um, those people in the 60s, they thought that they could derive somehow 
uh, what the imprint of causality was and the analytic properties of the S matrix, and they failed. So uh, why should we do any better now? And um, well, I mean, it's never a bad idea to, to try again when you have more, more clues, more, more data. Um, but I think there's also, a, there's also a growing new attitude about that, uh, about that the question, which is to not try to derive these properties, uh, to not try to say we take a locality and unitarity and that those are our God-given principles and then we derive what their consequences are on the properties of the S matrix, but to do something that's kind of the opposite of that and to guess, guess new patterns, new, new principles, new structures, look for new kinds of questions, um, they'll inevitably be much more abstract, they'll be alien, they'll be unusual, uh, just by the, by the nature of the beast. We're trying, to, uh, we're, trying to, uh, uh, we're trying to remove the reliance in our language and our, uh, the way we, we think about things on, on, uh, on, 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 uh, on local causal unitary evolution. So whatever, if we're not going to make those things primary, the, anything else that might be primary is definitely going to look strange to begin with. And it's not obvious that it's, that it's even possible uh, in general. But you can try. You can try to see, are there, uh, especially since uh, even in some cases, if we know how to check uh, whether the answer uh, is compatible with the rules after all, even in, even in cases, perturbation theory, tree level, just at the level of the integrand, whatever, if we know how to get, uh, if we know how to check, if we know what the properties are, then we can wonder whether there is some underlying different kind of mathematical structure and a different kind of question that you ask of that structure that produces these answers which have the properties of being compatible with uh, the things that we know to check to, to, to give us locality and unitarity. In other words, we can look for structures that don't have those things as inputs but have them as outputs. Now, we've seen things like that in the context of scattering amplitudes. Uh, the past five years, in the context of n equals four super Yang mills, we've seen it in the context of this strange geometric object that lives in Grassmannians, uh, the amplitohedron. In the past few months, we've seen it in a uh, much more down-to-earth context for a much wider variety of theories, uh, including, you know, well, phi cube theories, uh, theories of gluons in any number of dimensions, a nonlinear sigma model, uh, and here, but it's ex it, essentially exactly the same basic structure. There is a geometric object that lives in the space of, uh, of uh, the kinematical data of the, of the scattering problem. This turned out to be a much older mathematical object that's known as the isosahedron uh, and various generalizations of it, generalized permutahedra and so on. Um, but it's the same story. There is a geometric object. You ask a certain kind of question of that geometric object. The answer to that question are local and unitary scattering amplitudes. <laughs> Okay, and so you then see that where the locality and the unitarity, how they come out. They're nowhere in sight in the definition of the object. You see them come out as properties of the question that you asked. Now, I think that these things are happening, and, and the strangeness of these objects, their, their unfamiliarity, they involve um, uh, much more basically combinatorial ideas than we're, than we're used to seeing. Uh, I think these things are all related to the fact that they are butting up this against this question by doing away with uh, with with time. Um, but if anything like that has uh, has something going for it, we should also see it in the context of cosmology. Okay, so that's the second thing that I want to tell you about is the uh, is the uh, just the very start of the beginning of seeing something analogous to the isosahedron and the amplitohedron. It's really closer uh, even to the story of the, of the isosahedron. You don't need to know any uh, of, of those things. It'll be self-self-contained. But uh, there's something that we talked about in the fall known as cosmological polytopes. Okay. And the, but the, again, the general structure will end up being essentially identical. So I'm going to define an interesting class of, uh, of shapes polyhedra, really uh, polytopes in, in, in general high numbers of dimensions, and you ask essentially a question about the volume of this object or a closely related notion of uh, a certain kind of canonical differential form, and the answer to that question will calculate uh, the wave function of the universe. Okay? And then we'll be able to see how the, how the properties that, 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 uh, uh, that, uh, that are supposed to go along with the perturbative wave function of the universe are actually encoded in these objects. Yes. 
Yes, that's right. No, 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 that's right. I'm really talking about the wave function universe and not, and not the correlators. There is actually a correlator polytope. We could talk about that too, but, uh, uh, but, it's, um, but this, is, this is the primitive object underneath it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. And, and, for, and, and, so, and, so, and for, for, for literally the toy model that I'm talking about, for literally the toy model I'll be talking about here, you could absolutely apply it for ADS boundary correlators as well. However, you'll, uh, if, I, if I get there at the rate I'm going, uh, if I get there, you'll see why uh, the structure of the thing that I'm talking about is much more naturally associated with time. So despite the fact that I could interpret it as ADS boundary correlators too, there are many things you can ask about it which would make no sense in ADS but make perfect sense uh, uh, in uh, cosmology. For example, there, there are um, uh, the... Uh, various singularities associated with facets and boundaries of this thing are really associated with particle production and, and are not seen in, uh, in ADS. Okay. And the basic definition of the object, once we understand it, as, uh, as, uh, I hope it will become apparent that, uh, that, that, that time matters. Okay. All right. So that's it for the totally uh, introductory remarks. That's, that's the plan. What I want to do in the rest of this lecture is... Um, is go through one example and, um, and I think for the purposes of uh, coherence of the lectures, uh, we'll start next lecture with, uh, with a very systematic introduction to how to do all the calculations and uh, first in the free theory and then with interactions and all, all the rest of it because that will very naturally lead in to the story of the polytopes is what I want to end with. Um, but uh, I want to talk in the rest of this lecture about uh, some of the things that we also also mentioned, um, slightly more impressionistically, but, but we'll, we'll compute some things too. So, so the sort of general the general topic is uh, inflation as a cosmological collider. I had a paper with Juan a, a few years ago on this uh, basic topic. Um, and <clears throat> so um, this is something we, all, we always tell uh, journalists is that if we have uh, uh, inflation at very, very high energy scales and it's the highest energy uh, that, that the highest energy event the universe has ever seen, uh, you know, Hubble can be 10 to the 14 GeV, unbelievably high energy scales, so it should give us access. It should be like a big collider. Um, but how, how can that be true precisely? Well, let me make, an, let me make a little analogy. So um, when we have normal particle physics colliders, again, this is an analogy between amplitudes and correlators, the first thing you have to do is see what are the stable particles in the world. Before you collide them, they have to be stable enough for you to, uh, to have them around and collide them. Okay? So the first thing you have to do is see what are the stable particles. What does it mean to have a stable particle? It means that its two-point function is large. right? Its two-point function doesn't die off. Um, so you want to see what are the things that have macroscopic uh, two-point functions. Okay? So now, uh, because of Lorentz invariance, the behavior of the two-point function, there's nothing to it. You just need to know that it's there, right? You need to know you have a stable particle, it lives a long time. Uh, uh, but after that, what the two-point function is, is completely fixed by Lorentz invariance. So, that, so it's, uh, the symmetry is totally fixed. You just need to know that it's there. Okay? So this is fixed by Lorentz. So where is all the dynamical information? All the dynamical information is in scattering processes, non-linear non, non questions. Okay, so you want to discover what's what's uh, what's going on, uh, what the new particles are, what the interactions are, and so on. Um, so there are in these non-linear things like uh, scattering amplitudes. <clears throat> okay, and so now let's uh, ask the let's go back and ask the question about that experimentalist at the LHC. Um, uh, they do their, they do their uh, collisions uh, in the morning, they come back in the afternoon. How do they know that they made a D boson in the middle of the day somewhere? <laughs> or that they made a Higgs or, or something else? Well, let's think about it in the very simplest, in the very simplest case. Uh, 
um, of something which we sort of normally ascribe to tree exchange of some particle, if we're, if we're exchanging a particle of, of, some, of, some, of some mass m and some spin s, then uh, that shows up as the presence of a pole in the scattering amplitude. And therefore, so for instance, if there's something in the s-channel here, there is, there's a pole, 1 over s minus m squared. Okay, and then there is some residue upstairs that can depend on, on t, for example. Okay? So, um, first of all, the way this experimentalist can know something happened, that they, they produced a particle and then it decayed, First, then, you know, the whole picture is that they see a particular kind of, uh, of, of singularity in the scattering amplitude. By the way, sorry, let's take one step before that. How do they know anything is happening at all, right? That, that there are, things aren't just missing each other. Well, even if you haven't made the Z particle yet, or, or you're just barely making it, um, but let's say you're at low energies, the, the first thing you see is just the amplitude isn't zero, right? Um, so. Uh, it's not zero, but it has the simplest possible uh, analytic structure. It, it's just a polynomial. Okay, so so even before this, I might find that the amplitude is a constant, and it might have something that looks like s or something that looks like s squared with different coefficients. Okay, and t and so on. Okay, so it could be polynomials here, contact interactions. So that's the first simple. That's the simplest possible analytic structure. The next simplest possible analytic structure could have a pole, all right? And if you have a pole, you know that more, more is going on than just something is happening. You've made a particle, okay? And you know what the mass of the particle is. Now, you also know what the spin of the particle is. And you can determine what the spin of the particle is by, by doing a partial wave expansion of that numerator, okay? Um, and uh, so, what we know is that um, is that this is that the this residue of one over s minus m squared has to be written as a sum with some coupling constant squared that you see there. Uh, so that might depend on the spin of the particle being exchanged, but the exchanged particle will give you a dependence on the scattering angle. That's the s Legendre polynomial of cosine theta. Okay. That's how experimentalists determine spin. Okay, so you sit on a resonance, and, uh, and you see that you have to be able to think of the numerator as a sum over, over, over species of different spin of some probability to have produced the particle, which is the square of some coupling constants, really even a mod square of some coupling constants, uh, times the s Legendre polynomial of uh, cosine theta. Now, um, that's just group theory. Uh, how can we how can we see this? Uh, how can we see it in a more down to earth way? Well, um, uh, let's say I, I asked you, <clears throat> please couple this scalar particle to a particle of spin ten, uh, and just uh, calculate the sort of Feynman diagram of the tree exchange of that spin spin ten particle. How many of you would be afraid of doing that calculation? Okay, and why would you be afraid of doing it? Uh, I would be afraid of doing it because, um, because, uh, well, even writing down the Lagrangian for the spin 10 particle, there's an awful lot of indices there, lots of different ways of contracting the indices. How do you know you did it right? In fact, there's many choices. How, what even fixes what the choices are, right? So you don't tend to run into this for low spin particles, for instance, uh, although you should, you know, we, we write Lagrangians down all the time, blithely. So, so if, I, if I asked you to write down a Lagrangian for a massive spin one particle, uh, all of you would write something like this down immediately, right? That's what we're supposed to write down. Um, do you know why you write that down? That's not obvious, right? Because, um, why is this piece without mass is f mu nu squared? Why would you say it should be f mu nu squared? Anybody? Yeah, but it's not gauge invariant. What's your problem? <laughs> right? So why, why isn't it d mu a nu squared? 
or in fact, any combination, a d mu a mu squared plus b d mu a mu squared plus you know, m squared a mu a mu. Okay, what, what's wrong with that? And then that kind of problem gets worse and worse and worse as you go to higher and higher points. Okay? So that's why you might be scared of uh, doing the uh, calculation. Now, of course, there's a way of doing it. How is it the, the way people standardly do it is they find the equation of motion and then they make sure you're not propagating anything other than the spin, the, the particle of the spin that you're talking about. You're not, part of, you're not propagating any ghosts. You're not propagating any uh, particles of lower spin, so you have to try to make sure it's an irrep. But there's a lot of gymnastics and taking out traces and stuff, stuff like that. Okay? And this is gymnastics that's reinventing the wheel that was solved by Mr. Legendre in the 1800s. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to uh, describe just, just in a moment, um, well, what I want to describe now is how we can actually get this answer without ever talking about the uh, Lagrangian, just directly by looking at this, this uh, on-shell picture. Okay? I'm stressing this in this very simple context where probably most of you know what I'm talking about because, uh, because everything that we're talking about here is going to have a parallel in the side of cosmology, where all the complications that we run into here get infinitely harder if you actually try to do the calculations in, in a straight way. If I asked you to exchange a spin part, 10 particle into sitter space, you would really, you would probably kill me. It's, uh, it's very hard to do it even for spin two. Um, it's hard, it's not even easy to do it for spin one, but, um, but, uh, but, we'll, we'll be, but thinking about it like this will we'll make life uh, a lot easier. So where does this formula come from? It's just, it's just group theory. But where does it come from in a more nuts and bolts way? Well, you see, if all I care about is if all I care about is the uh, is the numerator of uh, one over s minus m squared, that is given. That's what unitarity tells me is that that's the sum of over all the polarizations. Of, that's the sum of all the polarizations of the product of these two three particle amplitudes. In other words, I'm producing an on-shell particle here. Uh, on the pole, and so I just take the product of these two three-particle amplitudes. Now, what are the amplitudes? Do I need to write down a Lagrangian to write down the amplitudes? I do not, because if I say that this is some spin s particle, so it has a polarization vector epsilon mu up to epsilon s, and there is momenta one and two, these polarization vectors have to satisfy that they're transverse to the momentum, obviously, and that they're traceless, so that I'm not propagating anything other than the spin s particle. Okay, but uh, even without this condition, um, what this three particle amplitude is, is completely unique, because I have to contract this mu index with something. What can I contract it with? There's the p1, p2, p3 is negative p1, negative p2, so that's not new. And so all I can do Every index can be contracted in some combination of alpha p1 mu plus beta p2 mu. But the combination p1 plus p2 is negative p3, and that gives me zero because of this. So the only thing that I'm left with is p1 minus p2. And therefore, the only thing the amplitude can be up to an overall constant, I'll call g, is p1 minus p2 mu1 up to p1 minus p2 mu s epsilon mu1. Mu s, right? So that's what the three-particle amplitude is. Okay, and so now um, when I exchange the particles, what I get on this side is uh, p1 minus p2 mu1 through p1 minus p2 mu s. On the other side, I get p3 minus p4 nu1 through p3 minus p4 nu s. And in the middle, I get the sum over all the polarization vectors, right? So I have to sum over all the polarizations, epsilon, lambda, mu1 through mu s, epsilon, negative lambda, uh, nu1 through nu s. OK, but what is this sum? This sum is just going to give me a whole bunch of delta deltas, or eta etas, right? Just by invariance. And in fact, uh, we can make our life uh, easier by going to the center of mass frame. If we go to the center of mass frame, uh, all the zero components of the, if we go to the center of mass frame, the massive particles at rest that we've produced, 
Because okay, we're, again, we're right on thrust with the mass particles at rest. So the polarization vectors are zero in the time direction. They're only non-zero in the spatial directions, first of all. So in those contractions, everything is replaced by just the spatial components. And also, P1 minus P2 is just some vector in the, in the, let's say, in the initial direction. P3 minus P4 is some vector in the final direction. So all I have, this has the structure. Let me, uh, let me write it like this. It looks like Xi1 through Xis. I'm just stressing these are spatial. Yj1 through Yjs. And now I have some big tensor here, Ti1 up to Is, J1 up to Js, which is just made out of delta deltas. But it needs to have an important property that it's traceless. It's traceless in if I take the trace in each one of the in in the i's or on the j's separately. Okay. Okay. Well, you can do it by hand at low orders. It's uh, it's it's pretty easy. But that's exactly what the Legendre polynomials are. Okay. That's their precise definition. <laughs> Is that thing exactly a tensor that's made out of delta deltas? Exactly a tensor that's made out of delta deltas uh, with the property of being traceless in each component separately or it's just the definition of the Legendre or the Gegenbauer polynomials in general. And if I just normalize these things to be unit vectors, uh, this, is, this is literally the S Legendre polynomial of x dot y. And if, if, if they're not unit, I would take that out and put an x to the s, y to the s out in front. Okay, so that's just the definition. Okay, so you see, yes. Yes, that's right. Because when I when I sum over all the when I sum over all the polarizations, the only thing I'm left with are are back the the mu and the new indices and and so it's some invariant tensor. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I, I should have said I'm, I'm I'm considering now the sort of simple case where these things are 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 just scalars. Uh, when they start having more, actually, if these are massless and massive, there still continues to be precisely one structure that you can have. But if they if it gets more complicated and and uh, if if more things are massive here, you can have you can have more more structures. But anyway, uh, I, this is not what I wanted to spend most of the time talking about. But but um, but uh, but what I wanted to point out is that. Um, uh, the choice you make for the Lagrangian is, in fact, exactly dictated by the requirement that it gives you, uh, <coughs> I can say it, the literal analog of this is that, you know, uh, if, if you have a Lagrangian, you'd have some numerator, uh, n mu 1, mu s, nu 1, nu s, over p squared minus m squared. That would be the propagator, right? All your work in choosing a Lagrangian is to choose a numerator, and it needs to have the property of this, it needs to be a tensor which is uh, which which is made out of eta eta etas and is traceless in taking out each one of them separately. Okay, and that's 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 what fixes that's what fixes the Lagrangian. So so it's it's uh, it's exactly this property of propagating physical particles that fixes the Lagrangian, not the other way around. And in fact, uh, so it's sort of particularly silly to write down the Lagrangian, derive the propagator, go back, shove through the Feynman rules, and bring it back because uh, it's inverting the uh, logic, okay? So we can actually directly, directly write it down. Okay, so, <coughs> all right, so, so now we've learned the next most complicated thing that we could have, okay? We could have things that are polynomials. The next most int uh, interesting kind of analytic structure we could have, we could have poles, and we learned what the rules are. The rules are that uh, the residue of the poles have got to be expandable as a sum over Legendre polynomials with positive coefficients. Then, yes. Sure, sure. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> Certainly not. And, and that's, uh, uh, as I told you, you can't even go beyond... Uh, uh, no, cer certainly not. But that's related to not knowing what the rules are. We see here. I know exactly what unitarity means. Unitarity means that it has to factorize like this. That's what I was telling you. At tree level, we know exactly what it means. At one loop, we pretty much know what it means. At two loops, we don't know what it means. Okay. But uh, but at this at this basic level, uh, we 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 do. Okay. Then, if we wanted to go beyond that, then uh, then the the next most complicated kind of struct uh, of of. Uh, Singular, you could, have, you could have branch cuts. That corresponds to loop amplitudes and so on. Okay, and that's that's where what we just said. We know what one loop means. Two loop is more complicated and so on. 
All right, so what's the analog of that, all of that in cosmology? So, so this is what we do in, uh, in uh, particle physics. And, and uh, I'm stressing it this way just, just so you see that the physics uh, that we've seen so far is almost completely dictated by symmetries. Okay? The only thing here was not dictated by symmetries was the actual particle content and the strength of the interactions. Now, what's the analog of all of this story in cosmology? Step one is to identify the object that has a large two-point function. Okay, well, that's what inflation has wonderfully given us. When we, and when we look at the spectrum of nearly scale invariant perturbations on the sky, that's the big two-point function that we're seeing. Okay, so, so we have the inflaton, and the two-point function for the two-point function for the uh, inflaton. Um, uh, it, so, if if I even think about fluctuations of the inflaton, this is just what we talked about in position space. <clears throat> uh, and this, this shows how little we actually have to know about the physics that gives rise to it. If we just know that it's scale invariant, then, then it could either be a constant or, uh, or it could have a logarithmic dependence on x minus y. But uh, just by dimensional analysis, the thing that in front needs to have units of mass squared, and if it's coming from inflation, it will be Hubble squared during inflation. Okay, so that's the big two-point function. Um, <clears throat> And again, the analog of the first interesting kind of interactions that we could have between the uh, uh, inflatons are just contact interactions. Okay? So just contact interactions might be like, let's say the, the inflaton has some nonlinear self-coupling, a cubic coupling, or a quartic coupling. Uh, um, let's say it has a, it has a, a d5 to the 4 coupling, something like that. Then... Uh, Again, since I'm looking at perturbations around the uh, perturbations around the inflationary uh, uh, trajectory, I can even sort of put one of these things on the background if I want. So really, um, even though the things that uh, our cosmologists care about are three-point functions, they really arise in the um, they really arise fundamentally from four-point functions in in the underlying theory. But one way or another, all of these things have the property that the interaction is local in time here. And all of these things, um, uh, they have a, they have an, the analog of the, just the contact interactions are the sort of simplest possible uh, singularity structures that we already talked about. These things go like 1 over k1 plus k2 plus dot dot, maybe to some power, and they have some polynomial dependence on the rest of the case upstairs. So that's, that's what contact interactions look like. Okay? Now, there's a very important interaction that's totally universal that we should always talk about. Um, uh, it's not so relevant for particle physics. It's very important in inflation. It's gravity. And um, uh, uh, back, back in the early 2000s, uh, uh, Juan Maldacena did this uh, beautiful calculation of the uh, inflationary three-point function that in this language we can think of as coming from graviton exchange. Now, this is something you might think is, now this is more exciting. You're, you're exchanging a particle, it's a graviton, it's a massless particle. It looks like this, should, this could give you something uh, more uh, interesting. But in fact, the, uh, the effect that you get here uh, is really coming from what you can think of as the uh, sort of instantaneous Newtonian attraction at this one time. There isn't any, uh, there isn't, uh, any communication between... Uh, between different times in an interesting way in this calculation. That, that should become more apparent when we talk about how to do these calculations uh, properly later. Um, but for now, all I want to say is that even this thing that comes from graviton exchange, uh, despite the fact that it looks like it, it's exchanging something, it's in fact uh, all dominated by occurring at the same time once again. And so once again, the kind of, kind of uh, three-point function, higher-point function you get from this is ex of exactly the same sort. <laughs> Okay, so they look like contact interactions. Okay. All right, so now let's go to the analog of this. Okay. So here you see, um, here, when you, when you expand, um, 
Let's say you're at low energy, so you haven't seen this particle. Of course, we know I can integrate it out. I get an infinite tower of higher and higher dimension operators. And so the low energy amplitude will be a polynomial like this. Okay, so to no order in this low energy effective theory, perturbation theory, to no order, do you see that there is a singularity coming your way? Right? And you just have a so but it has it has a finite radius of a convergence. Okay, so now let's ask um, in cosmology, the uh, analogous question. Suppose that we have a massive particle that we're integrating out. So let's say we have the uh, infoton and it couples to some massive particle. And I'm integrating it out. Well, at, fir uh, at first you might think again, if, I, if it's heavy, it's, you know, 10 times heavier than, the, uh, than, than Hubble during inflation, something. I integrate it out, I just get a whole tower of higher and higher dimension operators, right? Just a whole tower of contact interactions, and so I'll just get a bunch of things that look like that. Okay, I'll, I'll get something with like 1 over the sum of the k's, uh, for, uh, and then something with 1 over the sum of the k's to a higher power, cubed with some polynomial upstairs, p, p prime, p double prime, and so on. Okay? And this will be suppressed by some by higher and higher powers of m. So, to every order in effective field theory, uh, to every order in this effective field theory expansion, uh, you just get well. That's all we get. We get a bunch of contact interactions, and there's nothing different in the analytic structure of this uh, correlation function. But this is clearly missing some bit of physics. So, what is the bit of physics that it's missing? It's the same bit of physics that we're missing in the accelerator, uh, but reflected in a different, uh, in an interesting and somewhat different way. We're missing the fact that that time-dependent background could actually physically create, on shell, this massive particle. In fact, physically create a pair of them, physically create a pair of massive particles, and once they're created, they're sitting there and they'll, they'll you know, one will go this way, one will go that way, their wave function will oscillate, and then eventually one will decay to a pair of inflatons on this side, one will decay to a pair on the other side, or maybe if one of them is on the background, you would say that it oscillates into it on the other side. <laughs> okay, but anyway, um, and there should be some fingerprint, just like we have in uh, B meson oscillations or K meson oscillations, there should be some imprint of these oscillations in, uh, in, the, uh, in the correlation function. So, just roughly, what does that look like? Well, let's first get a rough idea of what the, what the sort of two-point function of this massive particle might look like. So let's say we have a massive particle here, m. I'm calling the particle sigma, let's, let's say. So what does its two-point function look like in space? Okay, just just, just on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the boundary. Well, what does it look like without any fancy schmancy cosmological stuff? Okay, you have a very massive particle. Uh, it's two-point function. And let's say I'm talking about it on, uh, you know, not on scales that are short compared to its Compton wavelength, where I can ignore its mass. But I'm talking about on scales long compared to its Compton wavelength. What do you think it is? Well, this has units of mass squared. But since it's a massive particle, the right-hand side can just be purely contact. Okay, so it's just a delta function, some delta cubed x minus y. And so, the leading order, it's just 1 over m delta cubed x minus y, right? So, very contact. Okay, and of course, it can have corrections, but this is what, what we're talking about. However, the, the effect that we're talking about here with the, uh, with the particle actually physically being created by the time-dependent background, it's going to be exponentially suppressed by the mass of the particle divided by the, by the scale of Hubble. You can think of that as a Boltzmann, fluctu uh, as a Boltzmann factor if you think of, uh, of the de Sitter space as being Hubble, or even more simply, just as a, as a, as a, uh, as the, uh, as the obvious uh, suppression that comes from the, the, um, the fact that this scale, that this is happening uh, on a much faster time scale than the, than the natural expansion. But there's, there should be a correction here that goes like e to the minus some constant, turns out to be pi, but it doesn't matter, m over h, it's valid when m is quite a bit bigger than h. But now, 
there should be something that actually oscillates. It goes like cosine x minus y. Okay, divided by some IR scale. And what makes up the units here? There's still 1 over m. What makes up the units instead of a delta cubed x minus y is a 1 over x minus y cubed. OK, so what is, the, what is the interpretation of this? The interpretation of this is that you created a particle. Okay? So we, have to, you, you, we, we, created, we, we created a particle at some, at some time. There's the oscillation of its wave function, e to the i mass times time. Let me be a little schematic here. There's the oscillation of its wave function that goes like e to the i mt. Okay? Now we have to remember that the scale factor in inflation is going like e to the Hubble times t. And so I can think of this uh, equivalently as a to the power of uh, m over h, of i m over h. Or if I think of it in terms of spatial momenta, this is uh, in, in momentum space, there's something that's going like k to the power of i m over h. Okay, because, uh, right, because the scale factor is stretching the, the, the scale factor is stretching the wavelengths. But if you produce it at some time, the number density of these particles is being diluted by the rest of the expansion of the universe, right? So, uh, so whatever you get should be down by a factor of, of the amount of, uh, uh, it should be down by an overall factor of 1 over a cubed from the rest of the expansion. That's exactly this 1 over x minus y cubed factor, okay? So this says that you, you're pair-producing particles that are being diluted by the inflationary expansion of the universe with uh, an amplitude that is uh, Boltzmann suppressed. Okay? All right, so... Yes? Uh... Well, you see, here there was no choice for it. Okay, here, here we knew that it had to be a contact; it had to be delta cubed uh, x minus y, and, it, and it's just that. Now, so, uh, you know that the this is what we'll see in a lot more detail. Again, I'm being pretty. We'll do all of this. Uh, we'll see it a little more precisely. But you know that the wave function of a harmonic oscillator is e to the minus omega x squared, right? And if you ignore, if it's omega is just m, then then it's uh, then then the two point function is just one over m, right? Okay. And in fact, it's really a similar argument here because we know ahead of time there has to be this 1 over x minus y cubed. There is this effect from the dilution with the expansion of the universe. And then again, unit just tells you the thing that sits in front has got to be 1 over m. All right. But if I'm, again, being a, l a little bit sloppy, I would say that there's a sort of a typical a fluctuation in k space of just one sigma. Now, this is in Fourier space that goes like k to the 3 halves plus i uh, plus uh, i m. And this is in order for, uh, for sigma sigma to have something that goes like uh, k cubed or 1 over x minus y cubed um, and the, with, the, with the correct uh, uh, oscillatory dependence. Okay, so... So what does that tell us for how we can? Um, so so that's 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 the physics of uh, that's the physics of uh, particle production. But now let's go see how that affects uh, the how that shows up in the three-point function. So all we're doing here, all we're doing, is uh, looking for the analog of sitting on the pole um, and seeing the resonance. At a collider, we're just trying to see the analog of that here cosmologically. Okay, well, um, if, we, if we think about, uh, 
what, what, we're, what we're used to seeing when we have an oscillation phenomenon. You produce something, it, and it has lots and lots of oscillations, and then you make two measurements at one time and a different time, and then you have oscillations in the time difference between the two of them. So the analog of that here would be to imagine that at some point here, we pair produce these, these particles. Okay? So one is going this way, and one is going that way. But this one goes a long, long way, and it, uh, and it decays the inflatons late. This goes, let's say, some, some shorter time, and it decays to its pair of inflatons. And as I said, this one is set to the inflationary background, so it's uh, sort of oscillating into this guy's turning into that guy in the inflationary background. This is happening early. So let's say this is some uh, K1, K2, um, associated with those momenta, and this is associated with some momentum K3. Okay, so again, something that you know is that uh, these things are going to be associated with short scales because they are produced later. Uh, uh, they had less time to be stretched by inflation before they came back into the horizon. These things were uh, produced uh, earlier, so they're longer distances. And so, if I, um, so therefore, this picture corresponds to something with a short K3, a small K3, and two much bigger K1 and K2. So in order to access this regime, where we can see this large time separation between these, these uh, two events, we have to probe the, the three-point function in an interesting regime where I keep K3 small and I make K1 and K2 bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? And now, roughly what do we expect for what the three-point function should uh, look like? Well, this is the, the sort of amplitude for this happening. Okay, so it has this... Uh, um, it's going to have... Uh, it's going to have a factor, uh, if I want e to the i m, you know, t, so let's say this is uh, event 2 and this is event 1, e to the i m t1 minus t2 is also uh, k3 over k1 or k2, which are about the same in length, uh, to the power of i m over h. Okay, so again, by the, by the same logic that uh, connects uh, that says that the scale factor is e to the ht. And so we expect that there is a, there's a feature in the, there's a feature in the three particle amplitude, there's a feature in the, in the three particle correlator that's proportional to, on the one hand, there is something that says that the whole thing is being, the whole thing is being uh, uh, diluted by the expansion of the universe. So that was that three halves factor that we saw before. There's an overall, sorry, let me write it here. There's something that's e to the minus pi m over h. That's the fact that it's an exponentially uh, suppressed thing. There is the, there is this k3 over k12 to the three halves. And then what I can have is, well, I can have the, I can have the, uh, uh, K3 over K1 or, or 2 to the I mu, and I can have it to the minus I mu. And there can be some coefficient here, and there could be some coefficient there. Well, but there can be some phase here, so let me just write it like this. So this is the sort of thing that I should expect to see um, in, this, in this limit. So in order to see whether a particle has actually been produced, not just see that there was some kind of interaction there, the analog of seeing the low energy scattering that comes from, uh, from sitting at energies much lower than the Z or something, right? Um, but in order to see that a particle is actually produced, I see it by going to this limit. I go to this limit where I keep K3 small and make K1 and K2 larger and larger. And in that limit, I should see this fascinating oscillatory behavior, right? E to the I, M over H, I apologize. I see this fascinating oscillatory behavior. It's suppressed by two things. It's suppressed by e to the minus, it's suppressed by the, the sort of Boltzmann factor, and it's suppressed by the overall dilution uh, between when this guy was produced and that guy, uh, between when, when one decayed and, and the other one did. Okay? But, so it's a, it's a small effect, but that's 
how, you know, in principle, sitting there in the structure of three-point correlations between the density of galaxies in the sky uh, can be clues to the presence of particles with mass close to Hubble during inflation. And if the mass of these heavy particles is not, you know, much heavier than Hubble, the exponential doesn't necessarily have to be a very big factor. These are small effects, but we're talking about potentially seeing things up at 10 to the 14 GeV. <laughs> And so it's, uh, it's sort of uh, uh, interesting that, um, that we can look for them in this way. But uh, there's one more factor I, sh I should have told you about. Um, the very fact that, I'm, uh, 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 that to do these calculations, I was putting one guy to its inflationary background, turns out to cost another factor of something uh, that knows about the slow rolling of the uh, inflaton. But I was more talking about this very interesting non-analyticity this uh, oscillatory behavior, um, which is the fingerprint of uh, producing the particle. All right, I'll come back a little bit to saying uh, how we can determine this more, more precisely, but I just want to say that this structure is the exact analog in cosmology of sitting on the pole, sitting on the resonance uh, at, at a collider. However, at a collider, you have the luxury of dialing the energy if you have enough money. Right? So if you're at very low energies, you can't see this. If you have, uh, you can change the initial state, and you can sit on the resonance, and then you do see it. In cosmology, we don't get to do the experiment again. The experiment was done for us once. We had a, one initial state that we had nothing to do with, but fortunately, it's a somewhat generous initial state because of the time dependence. Everything is actually produced. Okay? All the particles out there in the world are actually produced. Maybe at an exponentially small rate, but they're all, they're all actually produced. And so, uh, instead of dialing the energy of the machine in order to see the non-analyticity, we go to this uh, regime in the three-point function, the squeeze limit, in order to see what it looks like. Now, I said, oops, um, can I just take three more minutes? Yes, yes, no, no, it won't, it won't be more than three. It won't be more than three. At this level of impressionism, it will not be more than three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, unsurprisingly, well, somewhat surprisingly, I'm not just a factor of two slow, I'm a factor of five slow, so, uh, so I'll have to do something about that. But, um, okay, so, um, I, I just want to quickly end by uh, pointing out how this is entirely determined by symmetries as well. Okay? Uh, so, we just said that the two-point function is determined by scale invariance. Of course, it's not exactly scale invariant, but it's approximately determined by, uh, by scale invariance. You don't even need the full the sitter invariance, just scale invariance will do to determine the structure of the two-point function. What about the, this three-point coupling that we had between our two inflatons and this, uh, and this sigma particle? Okay? We know the, when, when, we have, when we have the sitter on the inside, the, uh, now, now we really do use the sitter, but when it's the sitter on the inside, just like an ADS, uh, uh, on the boundary, that's uh, the actual of the, of the de sitter isometries is that of Euclidean conformal symmetry on the boundary. And therefore, the Euclidean conformal symmetry uh, fixes the structure of these three particle couplings. Okay? So this is again fixed by symmetry up to the strength of the coupling constant, exactly like in the amplitude. And finally, what about in this limit? So what's special about this limit? In, in the amplitude, when we took the limit where we sat on the pole, we had factorization that told us that we got just the product of the two three-particle amplitudes. What is the analog here? The analog is that when I take this limit where these things are very far apart, let's say I'm just talking about a, uh, I'm talking about the four-point function. Again, always one of them is sort of uh, put, put on, on the background here. In this limit, this propagator is almost the same as if this guy went to the boundary and then came back from the boundary. Okay? So the propagators become closer and closer to the product of those two things in the limit as the distance between them gets very large. That's why you have to make the distance large in order for that approximate factorization, that approximate representation of the, of the propagator to be correct. But that means that in this limit, again, the four-point function or the inflationary three-point function once again becomes the product of these two three-point couplings that are fully fixed by symmetries. It's, it's the identical logic as for the case of scattering amplitudes. And finally, what about the spin of the particle? And this is, this is the thing, ah, one, one, one last little thing. What about these phases? These phases are a little interesting. They're not fixed by conformal symmetry. Okay? So just conformal symmetry by itself and nothing else would allow you to have any phases here. However, 
the, what, what we get in normal cosmological calculations has very, very fixed special phases there, and they're fixed by an interesting uh, consistency condition on the full three-point uh, three correlator. You see, the three-point correlator we see as an interesting uh, uh, this oscillatory behavior as you uh, make two of the sides long, but in principle, it could have singularities elsewhere. It could have a singularity, for example, as you collapse the triangle to look like more and more sort of flattened out like this. Okay? This is a garbage singularity. You can see it, it seems totally random. Where should it happen? Should it happen when it comes here? Or should it happen there? Or should it happen there? There's nothing canonical about where this singularity should happen. And one of the general sort of uh, features of every, all the singularities that we get uh, from interesting observables in physics is, is that they're there if they have to be and for no other reason, okay? These things are completely spurious. There's no reason for them to exist. And in fact, the absence of these singularities is really in one-to-one -one correspondence with putting in the correct uh, Bunch-Davies, Hartle-Hawking vacuum in the deep past here. So if you demand the no bad singularities in these collapsed triangle configurations, that, on the full three-particle amplitude, that actually fully fixes even these phases. But they're not just fixed by symmetry, they're fixed by one more assumption of the absence of uh, spurious singularities. And finally, how is the spin of the particle encoded? So, there's an angle in this triangle. As these sides get longer and longer, there's still that, that angle in the triangle. And, well, the only thing the answer could possibly be is that it gets multiplied by the s Legendre polynomial of cosine theta, exactly as for scattering amplitudes. Okay? And so you don't have to do a calculation for a uh, spin seven particle in De Sitter space and kill yourself to do it. Um, uh, this entire effect, the analog of sitting on the pole uh, for the scattering amplitude, is essentially fully fixed by symmetries, and this structure is how the presence of massive particles uh, can be encoded in cosmological perturbations. What we'll do next time is uh, um, I'll just quickly, uh, I'll quickly motivate what we're trying to do beyond this. So this tells us what things look like in these squeeze limits. Uh, uh, we know what things look like just with contact interactions. But what if we want to know what the whole four-point function looks like when we have tree-level exchange? Everywhere. For scattering amplitudes, we know the answer. It's just 1 over s minus m squared times that numerator plus contact pieces, right? That's the most general thing that we get with tree-level exchange. And we'd like to know the analog of that in cosmology. Okay? And if, that's, that's something where already here, if we did the calculation flat out, it would be very complicated even to see this simple behavior. If you want to get the whole thing, you're just left with a, a pretty messy, difficult looking integral over Henkel functions. And you can look up all the special functions in all the books. It doesn't have a name. So, um, so, uh, but that's the thing that we'll think about from this, uh, uh, again, from this perspective of trying to do these calculations purely from the boundary point of view. See, already we've figured out what this looks like purely from the boundary point of view, right? Just purely thinking about what the consistency conditions on the boundary are, together with some extra input about the absence of stupid singularities. But we'll go significantly beyond this um, in, uh, in, in talking about the structure of the full four-point function with tree-level exchange for scalars. And then once we have gotten some practice with calculating wave functions of the universe, in the final two lectures, I'll talk about, uh, um, in a slightly simpler set of examples, these uh, cosmological polytope objects. All right, thank you. Um, so we don't have much time because the Chandrasekhar lectures will start soon, but maybe we can have one quick question.